But I can't, on a serious note, I can't really help uh, launch this panel without making reference to the enormous contributions made to our reflection on these issues, these core issues of this conference uh, by uh, my mentor and colleague, Juan Lentz, um, and my fellow graduate student at Columbia University, at, uh, Al Steppen, uh, both deeply, deeply uh, associated with this great university. And as Susan mentioned, Al but died last week, uh, and we'll miss him greatly. Um, I was very fortunate uh, to be asked by uh, Al and, and Juan to contribute to the Breakdown of Democracy project uh, by contributing a reflection on the Chilean case. And one of the oldest democracies in the world, and one of the 14 cases that, that Adam has identified as a, a fairly consolidated democracy that actually broke down. Let me just say a couple of quick things. Lintz took very, very seriously that the structured characteristics of democracies in crisis uh, were an important fact. Uh, the actual and latent conflicts, the inequalities, uh, racial divides, ideological polarization, or perhaps more dramatically, when subalternate loyalties to tribe, linguistic groups, ethnicities, religion, or various combinations of these supersede lo loyalties to the broader community. Leading, in other words, to the phenomena that the Italians call irredenta, you know, where uh, the subalternate loyalties demand a sovereign state. Uh, indeed, this is the, with the end of the Cold War, this is the Pandora's box that has been opened with all of these sort of subalternate loyalties demanding a uh, sovereign state. And indeed, uh, it's extremely difficult to impose any state, whether authoritarian or colonial, on uh, what is not a nation. It is far more difficult, I think, to impose or to try to create or structure a democratic uh, um, um, collectivity, a democratic nation state. You have to have a nation before you create a state. You clearly have to have a nation before you create a democratic state. Uh, uh, but the central contribution, I think, uh, of the Breakdown Project is that agency does matter. Uh, social actors, individuals, leaders, parties can make a difference for good or ill. Though the choices really, really matter. Do they, do, do, do they add, uh, do elders and policymakers uh, focus on core uh, values? Uh, do they, or do they let uh, uh, what Juan Lenz called unsolvable problems become per, you know, something that paralyzes the society? I think of the Affordable Care Act here. Uh, uh, do uh, uh, they gradually permit uh, uh, the loss of legitimacy of, of, uh, uh, of uh, the rule of law, of the justice systems, the legitimate use of force? Do they gradually uh, um, um, abdicate their, their own responsibilities to take the high road to try to defend these institutions and so on and so forth? And, and in all of the cases of the Breakdown Project, you saw some of these elements. Perhaps the single most important was when the Democrats, when the moderates, when the folks that really were supposedly committed to the institutions began to sort of bail out for a whole host of various complicated reasons. And I think that these uh, 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 reflections uh, might be very important for our thinking about what's happening in this country at this particular time. Um, I'm fairly optimistic myself. I'll just finish with that. I happen to be now an advisor at Covington and Burling, this law firm in Washington, DC. It's an amazing law firm. It's the law firm of Dean Agenson, you know, president at the creation. Uh, uh, and uh, it's a regulatory law firm. Uh, it's the quintessential Washington law firm. Uh, Eric Holder just went back to the firm. He's representing the University of California system on DACA. You know, the firm has taken many of the cases on the travel ban uh, through the various different courts uh, like that. Uh, the projects on the issue of redistricting are also being addressed by them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that there are folks that are trying to, to uh, come up to the challenge that, uh, that Juan and Al uh, insisted on, and that is it is up to all of us to really sort of pitch in and to work to make sure that these institutions don't collapse. I will uh, stop there. Uh, let's uh, uh, turn to our panelists. Uh, uh, let's begin with, with Adam, who has a broader paper, and and then go down through the through various panelists, and we'll open it up to questions. Uh, 
How many minutes do I have? I think it was about 10 to 12. Uh, can you give me a five minute and a three minute? We can give you five minutes and three. Make the three minutes short. <laughs> <laughs> So if you regress the <coughs> probability of a democracy falling on per capita income, you will find that the probability of democracy an outright collapse of democracy in the United States, conditioned on income, is zero. Or 1.16 million, I think I calculated. If you do the same conditioning, the collapse of democracy on the number of past electoral defeats of incumbents, that probably is going to be zero. So if you want to learn lessons from history, we should probably just go home or <laughs> enjoy our afternoon drink. I think if we're here and if uh, some of you or us are nervous, it's because we think that maybe the current conditions are in some ways unique or unprecedented. The problem with learning from history is that if current conditions are unprecedented, history is no guide. But the question is, so are they unprecedented, are they unique, or are they not? And that's really what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to give you a little table. Unfortunately, reading tables takes time, so I'm going to be extremely quick. And then I'm going to go sort of condition by condition of various candidates of what may be unprecedented. What you see here is the following. There were 88 democracies since 1918 that were consolidated in the sense of having had experienced at least two partisan changes in the office of chief executive resulting from elections. So there were 88 of them. Of those, 14 collapsed and uh, the remaining 74 are still around. What you see in the first two columns are various uh, averages for various conditions of those democracies that survived up to 2008, those that fell before 2008. What you see in the third column is, are the conditions of these democracies that survived until 2008, after 19, 2008. And your last column is the US. As you see, it's kind of the results are banal. Income matters, gross matters, uh, functional inequality, labor share matters, household inequality, both before the transfers and taxes and after taxes and transfers matters. Uh, presidential regimes are more vulnerable, and I'm not going to comment on government crisis. Um, <coughs> If you look at, uh, compare the recent conditions from the past conditions, you see that the rec recent conditions tend to be sort of halfway between uh, uh, those uh, democracies that fell and those democracies that survive. And uh, you can 
draw conclusions about the US from by yourself. So let me now kind of entertain various candidates for what may be unprecedented. Um, as you know, uh, we've experienced uh, during some long period of time combination of relatively slow growth with increasing inequality, which results in um, most developed democracies and the stagnation of incomes of some 30%, 40%, 50% of the bottom of income recipients. It's hard to tell whether this is unprecedented or not because we don't have earlier inequality data, so we cannot look at long trends by income decile or quintile. What I do find unprecedented and perhaps ominous is what you see now that 64% of survey respondents in Europe and 60 in the US now believe that their kids are not going to be better off than they are. Now that, I think, is, uh, well, first, these beliefs are justified. There's a beautiful study by Cherry et al., which shows that, in fact, 90% of 30-year-old offsprings uh, uh, Sorry, yes, uh, we're better off than their parents in 1970 in the United States, and now it's only 50%. That, I think, is unprecedented I, you know, since 1820s, perhaps, in the Western world. We believe that uh, in material progress. We believe that our kids are going to be better off than we were. So the fact that that belief is shaken, and shaken for good reasons, is for me deep and ominous. Causes, I'm not going to say globalization, China. Uh, economists disagree. Uh, don't believe uh, Alter uh, in his various writings. Uh, it's very hard to figure out what the welfare effect of uh, China and NAFTA are. Uh, we know that there are certainly some uncompensated losers. We know that uh, being an uncompensated loser, being in a district uh, that is negatively affected by trade, uh, increases the probability of radical right voting, both in the United States and in Europe. But numerically, these effects are tiny seven-tenths of one percent of the vote in Europe. My favorite hobby horse, and this is going to be something which I hope is going to open your mouth, is this picture. What you see here, this is for the US, are trends in productivity <coughs> per hour of work and in hourly compensation. Look what happens. Around there. The same is true of uh, eight European countries. Basically, until a certain date, we had what I call a class compromise, increases of wages follow increases of productivity, functional distribution of income is stable, and whatnot. And then comes the autogolpe of the bourgeoisie, uh, neoliberalism, yes, and puff. Productivity increases, wages do not. That, I think, shakes the foundation of democratic class compromise. Uh, it's also true for eight European mm -hmm. uh, countries after 1999. In Europe, it opens up in 1999. Uh, what strikes me, this I have no idea whether it's unprecedented or not, it strikes me that people tend to think in racist terms. And yes, they vary greatly in racism, as you see, yes, uh, from the Czech Republic to Sweden. But this is Europeans. But they always distinguish Muslims, Jews, and Gypsies. So it's just the, the perspective yes, that they have is formulated in terms of ethnicity. <coughs> Finally, there are political signs of crisis. Um, in, you may or may not know, but the European party systems, 
were basically crystallized in the 1920s. From 1920s until about 2000, the same parties were getting top vote shares and were <coughs> in the government, in and out of government. From 2000, uh, the share of the traditional parties, the vote share of the traditional parties goes down, the number of effective parties goes up. There's every sign that the traditional party systems have been shaken up. The radical right is up, turnouts are down. This is just one note, but because it's, I, I find it particularly interesting. The rise of radical right is not associated with mobilization of people who did not vote before. This is not Weimar. Yes. In, in Weimar, yes, uh, <coughs> Hitler in 1930 brings five million people to the vote, half of whom they had never voted before. Here you see, I'm regressing uh, radical right vote share on turnout. All the slopes are down except for Denmark. So it's the centrist people who are withdrawing rather than the radical right that is radicalizing. The US, I'll just show you the slide, I'm not gonna even read it. But when you look at the comparative context, you will find um, that the US is truly an outlier. Now it's education is down, health is down. Just, I don't know if you know the case in Deaton piece, but it's really amazing. They compare mortality rates of basically 40 to 60 year old white males across different countries. In every country that mortality is falling in the US is just skyrocketing. No conclusions, I didn't present an argument, but just a list. But a couple of comments. Obviously, uh, collapse is not deterioration. There are all kinds of ways in which democracies deteriorate. Uh, uh, they have several times in the US, yes, post World War I, uh, McCarthy, Nixon, and whatnot. I think I am struck that um, institutions won in all of these cases. Yes. Somehow, there was an institutional way out of this crisis, institutions prevail. The point to which, which I find, well, central, is that what I think we're experiencing, experiencing is not a, well, it's only to some extent a political phenomenon. This is something that has very deep social roots, and they're part of the reason I'm going into economics, and into people's expectations of intergenerational mobility is because I think that the current crisis is deeply rooted in the society. So, this you probably know, 41% of Democrats and 45 of Republicans see the other party as threat to the nation. In Europe, we get the same language, traitors. Okay. Um, look at this one. <coughs> So in 1965, 5% of Republicans and four of Democrats would be displeased if the offspring married a supporter of the opposite party. Now these numbers are 49 and 33. Yes. So this penetrates the family. I, I lived in Chile between 70 and 73, and I remember there were rumors in Santiago that some father threw his daughter out of the household, not because she got pregnant, but because of political differences. And I remember we all thought, this cannot be repaired. It's just the terror is too deep. And that's what I'm afraid of most. And with this, uh, my thought is, we just really have to think, what's going to happen if Trump fails? What happens if Macron fails, Merkel fails, Brexit fails, Trump fails to do what? To improve the life of their supporters. What next? What's going to happen to this, these societies, which are deeply divided, when no political solution seems to be working? So let's not just you know, go after bashing Trump. 
but I think what's after. Thank you. I'm happy to sit here if that's okay. And talk from here. It's okay. Because I don't have slides. <laughs> I could, but I don't. Um, you want me to go? Should I start, Arturo? Sure, go ahead, please. Okay. Okay, I'm actually going to speak, um, I, I did do a memo and I will speak to that, but I want to put it into a little broader context and bring up a few additional issues. Um, others in this group will be looking at constitutional issues and at courts and at elections and Congress, bureaucracy, etc. And I want to think about a series of other kinds of behaviors that we're seeing. Um, that aren't just the voting behaviors or voting attitudes. And because I've done a lot of work on unions, I thought I would think about those in part, though I'm not putting it in a terrifically comparative perspective right now, though I, I could in, in Q&A. But I also want to do something I didn't do in the memo, which is to talk a little bit about the ways in which we think about trust and confidence in government and legitimacy issues, which is something else I've thought a lot about. So I'm going to bring slip that in at the end. Um, so what I want to emphasize is the important role that intermediary associations play in maintaining a democracy and in ways that were not really, I don't think, fully addressed in some of the other memos and in some of the literature. And one of the most important of those has been unions and labor organizations, not just in the U.S., but all around the world. They mobilize <laughs> votes. Um, they raise money for candidates. In the US, they're highly identified with the Democratic Party. In other countries, there are actually labor parties, um, though they are diminishing in power and strength almost everywhere they exist. But unions do something else, which is part of why I'm particularly concerned about their decline. And let me just give you a couple of figures about the actual decline, and then I'll tell you why it worries me so much. As of January 2017, the total union membership in the combined public and private sectors is 10.7% of all non-agricultural and salary workers in the US. That's still 14.6 million people, just to give it that number. But these aggregate figures really don't tell the whole story. Only 6.4% of the private sector workers now belong to unions. That's down from the high of 35% in 1954. That's a, a huge decrease. Um, and the other piece of the story is that a lot of the union strength that we do see is in the public sector, and that's under threat. The public sector and the private sector need each other in order to survive as unions. But the, the emphasis on austerity, the antagonism to government, um, all of those things are making it harder and harder, as the Wisconsin case shows, but many other states have now taken strong actions. We've seen a number of right-to-work states. Those are states that make it much harder, have a whole set of rules in place that make it much harder for unions to organize and collect dues. Come out of legislation in 1947, but are really speeding up now. So we're seeing something happening that's really anti-union. And the crucial period in the United States fits with that moment that Adam was emphasizing in the productivity, the, the, the divide between productivity and compensation. It's when Reagan comes in as president and um, begins a really very explicit anti-union drive. So we're seeing government mobilized to some cases and certainly the private sector mobilized to undermine unions. And a lot of language in the media and elsewhere making unions more or less illegitimate. Um, I do some work with on the gig economy, and the gig economy workers don't like the word union at all. They want to have voice, but they can't see, there's a total disconnect for them between unions and other forms of voice. Union has become a bad word. And I think this is really disturbing for a couple of reasons. One thing we can see among the Trump voters is a lot of the, tr some of the Trump voters at least, are people who would have been in unions if the manufacturing sector was still strong. Some of them still are union members. Um, and they're really, they're again the people who really are feeling the strongest dislocations as a result of the transformations, deteriorations in all of those 
factors that Adam just presented. What the unions did was it stood between attitudes of union members have always been heterogeneous. It's not that all union members are progressive. It's not that there were no anti-racist or aren't anti, I mean, there are no racist uh, union members. It's always been a heterogeneous group politically and in terms of attitudes. But the unions guided that. It created an institutional framework that over time, there were many anti, there were many racist unions and, and conservative unions at one point in time, but over time they increasingly became identified not with huge amounts of progressivism, but with social insurance and protections and progressive policies largely incorporated in the um, Democratic Party. And so, and they were able, and I, I can give explicit accounts of unions that very self-consciously um, worked with their members in order for them to understand why it was important to vote in a particular way, to act in a particular way. And the decline in that kind of institutional arrangement has been devastating for that kind of break on some natural attitudes that have always existed there but were mobilized in a different way or um, inhibited in a variety of ways. Maybe it was attitude repression of a different sort, but nonetheless it, it worked for a while. So when we see that decline, it's very disturbing and we're seeing this opening up of a space for a bunch of behaviors that are very problematic. When we look at uh, Charlottesville, for example, we see people on the streets um, who might well have been on the streets in an earlier period as part of a strike or part of something else. The one good takeaway from all this, it's not a good takeaway, but one of the things that makes me less depressed about it, I should say, is that if you think about historical cases, and we can think of many cases in which the unions were actually absorbed into the fascist movement, into the brown shirts, into, the, into Nazism, um, Peronist um, unions were key to uh, that regime. We're not seeing the organizations being taken over. We're seeing the people in the organizations being taken over. So the organizations, to the extent they still exist, are still trying to stand strong against that kind of behavior. But it's not a pretty picture when we lose these kinds of intermediary organizations and associations that are sort of standing there as part of the multiple sets of protections that we once had. I want to turn, I have another minute or two I imagine, I want to turn briefly to issues of trust and confidence, something and legitimacy, other things that I've been thinking a lot about and I probably was asked to be on this panel because I had, but got into the union stuff instead. We are seeing, though I don't like the NES measure that's now taken up in the general social survey and lots of other things of how we measure trust in government. It's really more about popularity and it only starts in 58. So when we say things like we're at all time lows, which we are in this measure of trust in government does federal government do what we like most of the time, some of the time, little of the time. Um, you know, all times lows were probably not since the high of the post-war period. They were probably well before that. Great Depression might have been a low period in trust in government if we had a measure of that. But still we're seeing something happening. We're seeing this huge secular decline in measures of a variety of measures of confidence and trust in government. And we're seeing it not only in the United States, we're seeing it everywhere. Um, the US is not the lowest, even among the developed countries. France is below us, or at least it was before Macron. I don't think the measures have been done since then. So there are other, but we're seeing it everywhere, just about. Um, there are a couple of countries that are escaping it, but not many. Um, what I want to <coughs> say here is that the trust and confidence in government measures, however we measure them, and there are a variety of ways to do that other than surveys. I do a lot of work on compliance with various government um, obligations. Is that their basic, that measure is really, and that way of thinking about things is really based on whether government is delivering goods and services that people value or not, and whether it's doing it in a way that people believe is procedurally fair or not. Legitimacy, it seems to me, is a different thing. So we're certainly seeing an anti-government feeling and a, a feeling that it's not being responsive. But is that turning into a legitimacy crisis, which is another question? 
And legitimacy, it seems to me, is not just about goods and services. It's whether we really feel normatively, positively about government, whether we think government is, has a right to exist and whether the people who are populating it are, have a right to be there. And it looks to me, and we don't have good measures of this, and it's very hard to have good measures of this, but if you look at what's happening in the streets in a variety of other settings, it looks like there are more and more people who are really doubting the legitimacy of either government itself or the particular people who are populating government. And it's not just happening in the United States. Um, and that seems to me a real concern and what's something we should be paying attention to. I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Timor? Do we move back over there, Timor? Uh, yes, I can. <laughs> At a time when uh, many of us are worried about democratic erosion in the United States and abroad, it's useful to remember that this is not the first time that established democracies have seemed under uh, threat. In the 1940s, Hayek worried that collectivist ideologies of both the left and the right were endangering uh, democracies. Hayek feared that even Americans might inadvertently destroy their democracy by putting too much power in the hands of government, which would then uh, abuse those powers. Now the source of uh, danger isn't collectivist ideologies. The danger lies, I'd like to suggest, in the erosion of a very basic element of the democratic uh, system, which is tolerance of differences of opinion and differences of lifestyle. Substantial parts of the U.S. citizenry are split into intolerant communities, communities that are willing to limit the free exchange of ideas and suspend the rule of law selectively for some higher purpose. Now, at the most basic level, there's a coalition of citizens who are suspicious of globalization, fearful of cultural change, economically insecure, and hostile to trade and immigration. There's no agreed upon term to describe this large coalition. Uh, let's call them nativists or America or the America First uh, uh, coalition. Uh, this overlaps, I think, very significantly with a group that Adam was uh, describing, people who believe that their children will be worse off than uh, themselves. Uh, there's a rival coalition of groups that define themselves according to some form of identity, chiefly gender, ethnicity, or sexual orientation, or that consider these identities uh, crucial. They emphasize group rights. Uh, again, we have no collective name for analytic purposes. Let's call this the Identitarian Coalition. I don't want to take too much time uh, pointing to signs of growing intolerance on the part of these groups, because you're familiar with them. Let me just list on the nativist side the alarmism of talk radio, conservative talk radio, the intransigence of the Tea Party, the themes and chants at Trump's rallies, the Muslim bans, frequent characterizations of Trump's opponents as un-American or, or unpatriotic. And on the identitarian side, there is advancing political correctness on campuses and in mass entertainment. Safe spaces are predicated on the notion that dialogue with the other side is harmful. You know about the violent responses to speakers on various campuses. An ACLU representative just a few days ago was prevented from speaking at William and uh, Mary. Now, there's nothing unusual about Americans pursuing their interests through groups. Tocqueville saw collective action by innumerable 
American groups as one of the strengths of American democracy. Moreover, in the America that Tocqueville so admired, associations enforced norms and they had strong convictions. Groups brought together like-minded people and they excluded people with different priorities. What's different about the two coalitions that I'm characterizing as intolerant communities is that they hold everyone else to their own standards, which they consider above criticism. They don't respect the other side. They aren't willing to listen to objections. They don't even consider the other side legitimate. To call an opponent un-American is to delegitimize them. To characterize someone as deplorable is to dehumanize them. Now, the intolerances of the two sides are mutually dependent. People hate because they feel they are hated. They censor because their own views are dismissed and suppressed. They lack empathy because their own problems are unrecognized by the other side. Conservative talk radio denies the difficulties of being gay in the United States. Universities aren't alarmed by the problems or, or, or not sufficiently alarmed by the problems of uneducated white Americans, the people that Case and uh, Deaton uh, uh, identified and, and discussed. Members of what I'm calling an intolerant uh, community don't consider themselves intolerant in any negative sense. They don't see themselves as denying anyone's basic freedoms. They think that they're drawing boundaries that are essential to human civilization. And this makes them reluctant to, uh, or close to compromise. Internally, these communities are quite diverse. There are shades of opinion, there are differences in priorities. Members may have reservations about particular uh, parts of the agenda of the broader coalition. The differences don't get much notice, however. One reason is that the communities themselves are intolerant, not only toward outsiders, but toward internal differences. They treat compromise by their members as uh, treasonous. Uh, differences get much less publicity, therefore, than their commonalities. We don't hear much about them. Another reason is that outsiders publicize their most extreme and most outrageous acts. So when speakers are denied a voice at universities, this gets huge attention on Breitbart. Bar a whole outrage machine goes into uh, overdrive. Drive. When there's no incident, which is 99.9% .9 of the time, lots of controversial speakers come to universities, we never hear about it, and Breitbart doesn't say uh, a word. Now, a society may have multiple intolerant communities that coexist in a rough uh, balance of uh, uh, power. And that's, I think, where we are in the United States uh, today. The present balance of power could continue indefinitely. The checks and balances of the American political system could indefinitely block their extreme uh, plans. And if we're lucky, at some point, one day, a charismatic leader will appear on the scene, redefine the political issues, forming a new coalition of uh, the moderates, uh, and, uh, uh, and the intolerance and peel away lots of people from these intolerant uh, communities. That's an optimistic scenario. But there's also, there are also possible scenarios involving one side gaining the upper hand and silencing the other. Remember that each community wants to wipe the other out. Neither is open to fundamental compromise. If it gets a chance, it will force its priorities on the other because it considers the other side illegitimate. So how, much, how might we get from where we are now to an authoritarian system, to one where one community acts on its hatred on a much larger scale than we're seeing uh, today? 
Of course, this is what I'm going to say is uh, speculative, but realignments have occurred in other societies, in other contexts, and what has happened in these other societies, uh, I think, may provide clues as to what is uh, possible. The communities may each be immovable in their basic uh, positions, but that's not the case for their individual members. And remember that in any given community, private views are more heterogeneous than the public views that we uh, uh, see. Each community has its closeted moderates who are movable under the right circumstances. A shock to the system, uh, an, say an economic shock, another 9-11, a trade war, a physical uh, a war, something like this could trigger public realignments that then alter the political incentives of, uh, of others. Moderates on one side can be the ones who start the, the dynamic uh, process. And realignments can then feed on themselves with the growing community gaining members progressively at the expense of the other. I'm imagining, of course, a cascade of the sort that we witnessed when communism collapsed people turned against the incumbent regime as the cost of doing so fell and the advantages of switching to uh, the opposition, uh, the anti-regime opposition uh, increase. We think of the cascade out of communism as a liberating process. In this case, what looks like liberating to one community would be oppressive to uh, the other. That, I think, is the danger of the current, the danger that the current climate of opinion uh, poses. I haven't said anything about how this plays out in electoral politics, how it plays out in formal governance. The polarization we see in Washington is a reflection of growing intolerance nationally. And I think, again, Adam showed us some, uh, some figures that, uh, that uh, support this. Polarization of the electorate has been underway since at least the 1980s. This is why presidential elections and Supreme Court nominations now turn into existential matters as they did not before the 1980s. If the balance of power gets upset and one form of intolerance gains the upper hand, plenty of politicians will be ready to serve as its instrument in the various branches of the government. A dictator may happily dismantle the checks and balances in the system on behalf of his supporters with widespread support. And we've seen examples of this in, in other countries where uh, uh, there's been massive democratic erosion. Turkey, of course, comes to mind, and Hungary and Poland, and there's several papers several presentations that will uh, get into those, uh, those cases. So Hayek's feared scenario will have materialized if we go down this uh, path, which of course I hope we, uh, we don't, uh, but from a different starting point, the starting point being not collectivist ideologies, but intolerance within civil society, within segments of civil society. Thank you. Are you using slides? No, I am not. So, uh, so I'm not going to use slides either because I really wrote more of a reflection paper rather than, you know, bringing tables and so on. And um, so what I want to discuss is how I see democracies failing and the period I have in mind is 1950 to the present. Uh, so there are many other cases of democratic collapse in the 19th century and before that I'm not really considering. Um, and there are basically three ways I see in which democracies uh, have collapsed in this period. One is at the hands of soldiers, so the armed forces. The other is at the hands of civilian leaders that uh, win elections, and these elections are democratic when they come to power. 
And the third form of collapse, which is really more a form of democratic de deterioration rather than collapse that is very serious in the region I work in, it's that democracies can be captured by criminal groups. So I will discuss the three of these forms of collapse or deterioration. We know more about the first form of collapse. There is significant uh, research, uh, a lot of it done by you know, people in this, in, in this panel that really we have accumulated quite a bit of knowledge of why democracies collapse at, at the hands of, of military um, rulers. And I'm just going to summarize those. So one important thing to consider is that, that military coups were quite common in the Cold War era. So the, there was really like the mode of collapse during that period. And to a large extent, that happened because um, it was le a legitimate course of action. The US really supported uh, military regimes that promised to, uh, to, you know, to fight communist threats. And also the Soviet Union supported extreme guerrillas and communist uh, parties that really wanted to overthrow Capitalism, that, that brought really a very extreme polarization, internal polarization, and that was not really conducive to consensus building. So, so that's a very important thing to consider in the contemporary period. I don't think that uh, military coups are seen as a legitimate action. Uh, and actually in many of the countries that we study, impeachment has become a really way of getting rid of, of, of rulers that, that people are really not happy with. Um, so the second uh, lesson from the literature is that income inequality seems to be very destabilizing for democracies. Uh, and we have you know, a lot of work on that in the political science literature showing how uh, giving the vote to the poor in conditions where you have these sharp inequalities threatens the rich and the rich feel you know, um, that they need to turn to the military to defend their assets. Uh, there are some puzzling results here because, uh, for example, we know that autocracies also redistribute. And also a puzzling result is that many democracies, even when they are stable, don't seem to be that redistributive. But that I will leave aside. Um, the third um, cause of collapse, um, it's really linked to poverty and lack of, of um, income. Adam Shaworski's work has really shown that uh, powerfully how democracies that are at a low income level are fragile. There is a small middle class, uh, there is large li illiteracy, and they become more vulnerable to collapse. And it's actually very interesting that also came up in uh, Adam Shaworski's work, why Latin America was more prone to this type of collapses. And in part, it was because our region experimented with democracy much earlier than other regions. So you have cases, for example, like Guatemala, at a very low income level, having a democratic system in, in the 50s. And those, uh, those regimes you know, show to be particularly unstable. Now my, my computer <laughs> went to, to rest. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, and then two more points. One is that a history of coups, but then seem to also make uh, systems more vulnerable. Although again, here we have to be careful because even if you have a history of coups, people might have stopped seeing the military as a legitimate course of action. Consider Argentina where the military is extremely illegitimate nowadays. And even when they have very severe crisis, they would not look back to the military. And the last point that we learned is also that serious macroeconomic instabilities, economic crisis, so failure of the system to govern really made these systems more unstable. Mm -hmm. So the second mode of, of deterioration and at some point collapse that I want to discuss and that is really more relevant for the reflections about the US is through civilian <laughs> leaders that ascend to power through elections that are democratic and here, I do not have in mind systems like you know, Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe because elections had never been really democratic. There has never been alternation of political power there or even you know, Mobutu, Mobutu said say in Zaire, but really leaders that come to power after a democratic election and then they gradually get rid of democracy by undermining checks and balances and uh, you know, at some point even repressing their opponents and, and even bringing the army to do that for them. So some cases are Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Fujimori in Peru, Putin in Russia, Orban in Hungary, or Erdogan in, in Turkey. 
And a more, more debatable case might be the Kirchners in Argentina. And so the, the key point here is that these leaders are sent to power through elections. So it is a, an important point to ask why voters support them. And so that brings a little bit you know, close to what Adam was saying about um, a sense of, uh, like democracy is not really representing a lot of uh, uh, people who feel disenfranchised. They see the system as sclerotic, the party system as unrepresentative, and really there is some anger against the existing institutions. And in addition to that, what we also see is that there are serious economic dislocation, joblessness, a sense of lack of social mobility. So these groups tend to support these you know, sorts of leaders. So I, 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 I want to give two examples. One was when Peru, uh, um, when Fujimori closed the parliament in Peru. I remember vividly there was this interview by David Wellner in National Public Radio asking a woman, you know, about the parliament being closed. And the question was, well, do you support this? What about democracy, senora, he asked. And then the woman turns and she, democracy? These guys in the parliament, they only, they only rule for themselves. You know, Fujimori comes to talk for us. So, so nobody was there to really defend the parliament when, when he closed it. And the same you can say about Hugo Chavez. I mean, there was this very oligarchic system in Venezuela, alternation of political power, but there was really no voice for the poor. This system had permanently sort of ignored the poor. The poor had not really, you know, played any role in the system of redistribution. There was very limited redistribution in a very inegalitarian system. And I still recall the National Assembly after that big win with 90% of the votes when, when he you know, came to redraft the Constitution. It was the first time I, I was surprised to see all, you know, so many black faces in the Assembly. And then, then I asked, you know, is this common in Venezuela? And obviously, that was not common. That was the first time that you saw those faces in, in, this, in the, you know, sort of in the institutional apparatus. Okay, so key to, to this is that they come to power through elections, but that they continue to mobilize voters. And, and that's really, I think, where the U.S. will stand apart from these cases, continue to mobilize voters in a way that they really amass a lot of power. So when I'm thinking about the elections that Hugo Chavez won, he was winning with 80 or more percent of the votes. The PRI in Mexico was winning at some point, you know, with 92% of the votes. And what that really gives them is the power to undermine the system of checks and balances. And that is really a very different context to what I see, you know, happening in the US for many, for many reasons, including federalism and a very vital federalism here. But we have to understand how they amass so much power. And so one of the critical things they do, for, and, and this is very clear in the case of uh, Hugo Chavez, but also it was very clear in the case of, of, of Mexico, for example, during the PRI regime, is that they use a lot of government programs and resources to mobilize voters in their favor. And, um, and give, let me give you the example of, of um, Las Misiones Bolivarianas that Hugo Chavez created. He used a lot of oil money to create this ample system of redistribution with the creation of health clinics, schools, and a lot of you know, sort of direct help to the poor. And what really was critical about this is that he was able to target these benefits to whomever supported him. There is a very interesting and very systematic evidence with this My Santa list that you know, the government came um, um, to his hands, the names of the people who had signed against uh, Hugo Chavez in the referendum. And there is very solid evidence that those people um, received less jobs, received uh, fewer government benefits, and were directly punished. So the same patterns we observed in Mexico during the era of you know, hegemony is that the PRI really was able to tell who the supporters were, who the opponents were, and assign benefits to those who supported the system and really punish those who didn't. So in the end, what happens, what we call in our work the tragic brilliance of these systems is that voters, and especially poor voters, end up playing a very active role in supporting this system. Uh, but they are not only, you know, these leaders are left-wing populists, but they are also right-wing populists. And so that's what we see, for example, in the cases of Hungary that I was mentioning and, and Russia and so on. And 
The way of mobilization here is slightly different, and it's, it really it's about racism, and it's about blaming the minorities, blaming the outsiders for the ills of society, for the fact that there is no benefits for you, for the fact that your group doesn't have social mobility, there is no hope for you, and I think that's a common strategy to mobilize uh, support. And the question is whether this type of strategy can really cement uh, popular support, support the way, you know, the Chavez's regimes and so on do it. Okay, so the key question here is, is when democracy stops being democratic here, and I think, to, in my opinion, is really when the system of checks and balances is undermined to the point that only friends of the regime are in the institution. So as I was mentioning, Chavez redrafted the constitution. The National Assembly was elected with 90% of his people. He you know, undermine term limits, he packed the court, he, you know, he, you know, do the electoral tribunal according to his interest and so on. And th in that moment, there are no ways in which you can really limit the, the, the rulers, no? What other strategies they use? Well, they start to turn violent and they start to turn violent against their opponents. They start jailing their opponents, undermining the free press and so on. That, at that point, we are really talking about a different system. And in all the cases that I study, they do, you know, these sorts of, sort of abuses. So a question that we really need to ask is how these leaders can get away with it. And so I, I want to give three, three points. One is that in, in, in many of the cases I study, they use a really intelligent strategy to divide opponents. So it's very easy to co-opt those opponents. They want to act loyally with the system, meaning that they want to compromise with the system. So in, do the, in doing that, you bring them you know, to your parliament, you bring them to the table of negotiations while isolating the opponents that want to be sort of more radical. And that, uh, I'm not going to go in detail, but that really can play a very nasty <laughs> role in the system because there is no coordination against the rulers. Second point is lack of societal coordination against abuses, and I think Barry Wangas has really uh, written a very interesting paper about how social consensus is really necessary to put a halt to these authoritarian abuses. And I'm going to go a little bit fast here, but things like extreme social polarization, divisions along religious lines, ethnic lines, or in the case of the US, for example, really strong divisions along party lines can really undermine this you know, sort of capacity of society to coordinate against abuses. And that is a very important uh, thing to consider. The third point I want to mention is that not all these abuses are common knowledge, and that is also problematic. So when society has very different interpretations about what happened, it's going to be very hard to coordinate. So you know, the case of electoral fraud, which I have worked you know, uh, um, a lot with, it's, it's clear, you know, fraud happens in secret, so it's not really clear for society whether elections were really rigged or not, and the information is not common knowledge. So that is going to complicate coordination, but fraud is not the only abuse that happens, so when, there are all these interpretations about facts, or, you know, the, I think that's really um, <coughs> problematic. And lastly, I want to talk about protests, because that might be one way in which society really can put a stop to these regimes. And obviously we have seen a lot of cases in which protests succeed in bringing autocracies down or this, this form of you know, sort of um, weird democracies down, but um, I am sort of n not fully optimistic about this. And, and the reason why I say so is for two, two, is for two reasons. One is that protests can happen, it can bring about change, but if society doesn't have a unified voice, it's going to be very hard to create a new system. I mean, we saw that, for example, in, in, in Egypt. So that is something that we need to consider, that you know, sort of social mobilization might not really create a new alternative. Um, and that can be problematic. And the other thing that um, I, I recently am working on a paper that shows that protest is paradoxically more damaging for regimes that are more autocratic uh, and where there is more repression than for regimes that are more open. So I have a system, that, you know, a paper that really shows that, that you can paradoxically have a very serious costs to protest in you know, authoritarian regimes because obviously you can be uh, killed, you can be sent to prison. The, you know, there is very hard ways of communicating among people to coordinate protest. But when protest happens, it just signals a lot. 
about the underlying dissatisfaction and about the weakness of the regime. Whereas in democracies, we see protests all the time. And so that is not necessarily sort of signaling much. And again, it's a problem of you know, how with all these protests, you know, everybody you know, voicing different things, you are going to bring about social change. So lastly, I, I just want to very shortly talk about the last form of deterioration of democracy, less relevant for the US, but very relevant for many areas of the world that I work in. So this is when institutions, and this is democratic institutions, but all, the whole set of institutions are captured by criminal groups. So imagine a system where criminal groups decide who runs for office, criminal groups fund candidates, criminal groups assassinate candidates they don't like, and criminal groups appoint police chiefs. No? So this is really what I have in mind when I call a sort of a, a democracy capture by criminal groups. Yes, you have elections, there is alternation of political power, but really, you know, if things were in, in the way that criminals don't like it, then you get killed. And this is a really serious, a very serious deterioration of democracy. In many parts of Latin America, so some parts of Colombia, during long periods of time in Colombia, where you have this association between the paramilitaries and the politicians, and today in many parts of Mexico, also you can think of Honduras, Guatemala, you see some of these uh, sort of very uh, nasty forms of rule. Um, although, granted, it is more at the local level, but I just want to finish with this, you know, sort of very famous case that, of course, you have heard about the disappearance of the 43 students in Ayosinapa, Mexico, where after investigations, it really turned out to be the case that the local mayor had uh, given these 43 students to the local criminal group. The local criminal group uh, killed them you know, dumping in a mass grave or, you know, burn their bodies. And then in the end, there was another investigation by an international, you know, commission. And the investigation also suggested that probably the armed forces were involved in this disappearing. So uh, uh, as of this point, there are more than 30 disappeared, 30,000 disappeared uh, people in Mexico. Uh, more than 200 mass graves have been found. And, and this is the type of sort of routine activity in which you, in which there is, you know, sort of no one to defend people from criminal groups because criminal groups are really sort of embedded in the institutions and are really appointing the chiefs of the police in the, in the sort of municipalities. So I don't know really how to call this, but I, I really see in terms of, for example, human rights abuses, repression, the murder of journalists and so on, Mexico has never been worse than right now. And our system is democratic, no? So, so that is really something we need to consider. But as I say, less relevant for the discussion here, fortunately. Ojalá. <laughs> Thanks very much. I guess I'll take the prerogative of the moderator and ask one question of each one of the uh, uh, colleagues who made a presentation. Adam, uh, you did mention uh, that the U.S. is the only presidential system with indirect elections. Um, and uh, I just wanted to sort of ask you this question. Given the fact that uh, Donald Trump uh, won with less popular vote than any president in American history, with the exception of two, uh, given the fact that uh, he only won 30 percent of the a vote of the eligible electorate, uh, not the electorate that voted. Given the fact that the uh, president, uh, uh, the exiting president, had 57 percent approval ratings and he had 45 percent, and he's down to 35 percent, I'm just wondering to what extent this would make a difference if you actually had a situation where there was a significant reform of this process and, and allow democracy to prosper. Um, not to get into the to the issue of the Senate, uh, where 17 percent of of the population, like 50, over 50% of the Senate. Uh, um, Margaret, I was wondering if, uh, if uh, in, in, in your case, you might comment um, on uh, the, the, your very compelling story about what's happened with the union movement, what's happened more broadly with the inter intermediate organizations of society. Going back to Tocqueville again, and I'm reminded of uh, Kornhauser's book on the politics of mass society, where a critical point is, in fact, the absence of uh, intermediate institutions, 
or maybe even Bob Putnam's, uh, you know, Bowling Alone. Uh, what's happened more generally with uh, the issues of trust and confidence with a society that's always had a very, very rich tapestry of uh, intermediate institutions uh, of all kinds, NGOs, et cetera, et cetera, at the, at the local level and all kinds of levels with uh, enormous commitment to, say, international uh, assistance and things like that. Tim, uh, in your case, um, I'm also wondering when you said at the beginning of your presentation that substantial parts of the U.S. citizenry are in intolerant communities. Again, I like. I wonder what that means. What percentage of the the, the population is in these in, intolerant communities, um, and how do they stack up in terms of intensity? I would think that, that would be a very important thing. You know, uh, I, I, you know, what is the high intensity? What is the medium intensity? What is the sort of moderate or indifferent intensity of those? Uh, folks, uh, um, and, th and then th the polarization in Washington is probably not that kind of a polarization. It's a different kind of a polarization. Anyway, and then finally, Beatrice, um, and the three uh, uh, points in terms of uh, the failure of, uh, or the, the coups, ex executive aggrandizement, criminal groups. Uh, in my own work on sort of uh, presidencies interrupted, the fact that 18 presidents have not finished their terms of office mm -hmm. in this era of democratization, there have only been two classic military coups, we're facing a situation of paralysis. And the, per the situation of paralysis is in some ways contrary to the aggrandizement because these are people that, that are able to uh, uh, muster majorities. It's minority politics, essentially. And here we get back to the issue of presidentialism yes. as well, where you have presidents that don't have significant working majorities in Congress. So uh, if you could keep your response really short so we could also open it up to the, uh, to the audience, I would appreciate that. Should we start with you, Adam? So. <laughs> uh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I think just that when the formal rules by which elections in particular are organized uh, offend people's sense of fairness. It's harder to swallow the defeat, yes? I mean, democracy is all about swallowing defeat. Yes? So that's what the game is about. And uh, people have this instinctive majoritarian feeling about it. Yes? Uh, in France, uh, a party which now systematically gets about 20% of the vote had one parliamentary deputy in 671. And somehow people find it offensive. It's proportion, they, they think of majority proportionality. So I think it only has this kind of a minor uh, effect. There were some people who, after the election, who said, well, 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 but you know, this is unfair because, in fact, Clinton won the majority. I don't know if it's consequential. I think presidentialism versus parliamentarism is consequential, but that's a longer story, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Well, maybe the, the last panel of the day will cover whether or not we ought to scrap the uh, electoral system, uh, oh, we, <laughs> the uh, electoral college, and uh, and certainly get into redistricting. That. We can vote on that. How about that? Yeah, we can vote. Yeah. On that. <laughs> that would win That's easily. Political science experts, exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we could do another survey of experts. Margaret? <laughs> so generally, I do think intermediary organizations are in some kind of decline, though I'm not prepared to give you all the figures. But let me just mention two kinds of things that have been intermediaries. Um, one has been religious organizations. And we're seeing a huge decline in general religiosity. So that the kinds of, uh, there's a project at the center that I run at Stanford which is talking about the digitally native and how they're developing their values. And one of the problems is that very few go to religious organizations, weren't raised that way, don't get values that way, and they don't go to the dining room table at dinner with their parents in the same way. So there are a variety of ways in which there have been social breakdowns. That does, the other kinds of religious organizations are, of course, on the rise. Um, so evangelicals in the U.S., uh, extreme sects all over the world that become kind of echo chambers of a particular uh, set of ideas and beliefs. And that's then interacting with the transformation in the media, which we've all been very alert to. If you look at the um, 
figures on trust, the only thing that uh, seems to rank with the decline in distrust in government is the decline, decline in distrust in media. Uh, and again, people are going to media, whether it's social or print or whatever, to the places where they're getting what they're getting feedback on what they already want to believe, um, as opposed to the Walter Cronkite figure who might have been making a, a larger message. I don't think we've we've got a handle on this yet. I think this is something that that deserves a lot more study. I mean, we're we're saying things that we know. Um, I think there's one other point to make here that it's the effect of some of those things is it is enhancing, I think, this kind of social, the larger societal problem we're seeing, which has multiple factors, as, as several of the speakers have talked about. And that is leading to what is potentially a legitimacy crisis, a, a lack of trust in media or government or religious organizations doesn't lead to conflict, it just leads to dissatisfaction or but if you really have different beliefs about whether the government is legitimate, whether the electoral process is legitimate, that's what leads to or some of the things Timur was talking about, Beatrice was talking about. That's really what leads to the conflict, and that's very hard to mediate once it takes hold. It's very hard to figure out how to overcome it. Thanks. Um, in my mind, the, the echo, and I agree with what you just uh, suggested, but having participated in the march on Washington, you know, the Women's March on Washington afterwards where everybody was yelling, democracy matter, democracy matters, maybe there is a little bit of a silver lining. Can I just say one other thing? I mean, one of the importance about the unions, though, that is distinctive from the religious organizations or from media is that they are fundamentally about distributional politics. And they're, they're just not, they're not necessarily representing the poor, depending on the country, so that voice may still be repressed, but there really is a lack of voice for serious distributional politics when you begin to undermine the organizations that represent workers. Timur? So the percentage of people who would be disturbed if somebody belonged to the opposite party moved in next door has skyrocketed. The percentage of people who would be offended, who would be upset if their son or daughter married somebody born to the other party has, again, skyrocketed. And the figures are uh, far higher than the comparable figures for race are. So there are many people who would not be offended if their son or daughter married somebody of the opposite race, but party is the, is the big issue. Why is this the, the case? Because they would find it difficult to communicate with them. It is, they wouldn't even agree on what the basic issues are. Uh, the fundamental issues requiring dialogue and the solution are. It was much easier in the times when we had when labor unions were uh, many more members and the fundamental conflict in the United States and around the world was the division of the gains from labor between labor and capital. And the fundamental conflict, in, in, that was considered the fundamental conflict in society and we use the left-right spectrum to describe that that goes back to the French Revolution. That is no longer the fundamental source of conflict. We have two groups in society that define the fundamental issues as very different, and they don't even agree on that. So that's, they can't even start a, a conversation because they can't agree on what the basic, uh, uh, basic uh, issues are. Uh, so that's one, I think, indication of rising intolerance. Another is on, on campuses, if you look at the people willing to block speakers, it's not just a few uh, uh, radical professors who are doing this. There's increasing support from the students themselves. And uh, this, is a, this is an indication of rising 
intolerance and the uh, the young generations. The polarization <coughs> in Washington and politics in, in general, I think, is a reflection of this. There's a lot of talk about gerrymandering. I think that's uh, secondary, if not uh, uh, tertiary. Voters don't want their representatives to, uh, to compromise. They will turn against their their uh, representatives if they do get into a dialogue, if they do try to come up with a bipartisan uh, compromise. This is a reflection of what's happening in, in society at the, within civil society where we have groups that are not communicating with each other. They don't know how to communicate with each other, and that gets reflected in the uh, in the system. So I, I think this goes back to what Adam was saying. There's a deep, deep issue here that is the source of the the fundamental source of the uh, the problem, and it's not just the institutions in Washington. It's not just electoral politics. May, may I? Yes. I mean, I certainly agree with sure. that, okay. but I think you have a problem disassociating it from uh, economic issues and specifically income inequality. I don't know whether mm -hmm. you've seen the picture by Paul Rosenthal or somebody, which is a correlation between Gini index income inequality yeah. in the U.S. and polarization in the House of Representatives, yeah. and it goes down and up like a U. The correlation of this is over time is 0.92. It just almost perfectly corresponds. Yeah. So I, I think it's driven by economic issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Not surprisingly, John. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, okay. So I, I think this is a really interesting question because, I, I mean, as we know, a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of the um, Cases that used to be solved through military coups, then now are solved by impeachment and things like that, that, that in a way result from this paralysis that you are talking about. And Evil's book is really great. I love giving that to my students because it's really sort of the new mode in which these um, this democracies, at least in Latin America, where, where he focuses, uh, deal with the paralysis. So the the problem with this is that at some point voters might reach the conclusion that institutions are irrelevant no? and are illegitimate and there is really no sense in continuing to go to vote and so on. Um, Milan has a, is a, a, up there, has a really great paper about this, you know, when voters reach this conclusion, you know, sort of every politician is corrupt, you know, nothing really works. That really is a big problem that in a way opens up for this type of rulers that I'm, you know, talking about. Um, so, yeah, all, all of this is related in, in the end to the, you know, legitimacy of the, of the system, no? And in that sense, I, I do agree that there is an issue with presidentialism that um, you know we, we have discussed it a lot in you know in political science, but but it seems to be harder to deal with these issues in in this type of constitutional system. Thanks. Well, uh, our time is running out. We'll take uh, how about three questions that are right there now, and I'll start with those. And why don't we just take all three, and then you can address the the panelists, and then they can respond. So we'll start with you there, sir. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I was remembering um, about five or six, seven years ago, there was an article in the New Yorker and it said something to the fact that Marx may have been incorrect in his prescription for deals of capitalism, but he was dead on in his critique of capitalism. And, and um, you know, what was just said about the correlation between you know, income inequality and all of the things we're seeing, um, you know, the defunding and the attacks on public education uh, the science denial. I mean, you know, this, someone was talking, it seemed like there was this false equivalence. I mean, we have one party that simply does not accept science, does not accept a fact-based, you know, approach to reality. Yes. Um, we have Citizens United. We have the American Legislative Exchange Council, which was a way that 
big funders are able to, to funnel money to state governments to change laws that they maybe couldn't pass on the federal level, but they can attack it state by state by state by state. You know, you can just kind of go on and on and on. There's also just massive voter suppression taking place. People are talking about Russia and what's Russia's involvement, but we know that the voter suppression efforts by the Republican Party you know, has been ongoing. And so I was just wondering if you could kind of address this. And the question that I have really is, is the United States even a democracy? I mean, we have democratic trappings, we go to the polls, but if you can't really have uh, distinctions that, that matter between candidates, do we live in an actual democracy? Thank you. The most hopeful of the four speakers was Margaret Levy. <laughs> and she actually outlined a strategy. Uh, and I want to support that strategy. I want to associate it not only with Margaret, but with Prana Bartan, who is an economist at Berkeley, who has a very Boston Review published a few months ago on right-wing populism. Barghan is not concerned only with the United States and Europe, but perhaps primarily with developing countries, uh, namely particularly his own country, India, Modi, and uh, Erdogan, and Turkey, uh, Philippines, uh, South Africa, and so on. And Barghan says the solution to the struggle against right-wing populism is to build not only in developing countries, but in poor countries. And in poor countries in particular, since the organized unions uh, represent maybe the top 20% of the population, uh, the, the, the goal of the trade union movement should be to represent all workers. 80% of workers in India are in the informal sector, something similar perhaps in South Africa. And Barhan outlines a, a six-point program for what unions should do. Now, I think that the role of unions is intimately related to the issue of trust. And I think that the focus upon the decline in trust has been a bit uh, oblique, in my, in my opinion, by the speakers. Namely, it's focused upon the issue of trust in government. And I think the key issue is trust between people in the country, trust of citizens, trust by citizens of other citizens, or residents of other residents. The most, uh, the most uh, 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 extreme form of the deterioration of trust in racism, xenophobia, and nativism, but it takes much uh, more minor things, right? What trade unions did, in particular, was to educate workers about solidarity. Solidarity means the recognition that we're all in the same boat. And to the extent that there's a lot of income inequality, it's not true that we're all in the same boat or it becomes much harder to see that we're in the same boat with other people who are much richer than we are or much poorer than we are. So I think the, the increase in, in income inequality has been uh, critical for the deterioration of inter-citizen trust. And I think the union, build, rebuilding the union movement, uh, is uh, the, the happiest solution to fighting that. I want to conclude by contrasting this uh, strategy to the strategy of Sherry Berman, which was Sherry Sorry, Berman. could could you wrap up your your comment, please? Yeah. yeah. Sherry Berman wrote a, a, a an op-ed piece in the New York Times. I think it was on Monday, in which she outlined the strategy of progressives as winning over a section of the uh, Trump voters to uh, progressive ideas, and hence having an electoral coalition that could win. Say that's sort of the Democratic Party approach. And I want to contrast that to rebuilding the union movement, which is a really direct way of attacking the issue of black. Thank society. you very much. Yes, so this is a question for Professor Karan. Um, so you present a picture of balanced coalitions um, in which extreme, you know, there are extremists and then there are silenced moderates. And I'm curious about you know, the extent to which that really maps onto the American party system as it exists today. Because um, after all, like, so parties and candidates won elections, not you know, talk radio or pissed off college So, I mean, I can think of a few really structural reasons why you would expect 
um, extremists to be more likely to dominate on the right than on the left. For example, the geographic distribution of, vote, of left-wing voters is such that um, the Democratic Party has to sort of appeal to a broader coalition than the Republican Party and so on. Um, and if, that's, if I'm right about that, and people like Jonathan Waller are right about that, then you know, why does it make sense for you to dismiss you know, institutional factors like gerrymandering as you seem to do so? But it seems like the institutions are the reason that these extremists are heard and are heard more than once. Thanks very much. Timur, why don't you take that last one? Uh, Margaret, you take the pre preceding one, and then the, anybody in the panel could do the first one. And, and we want to wrap up very quickly because you, our next, we have our next, another panel in 10 minutes. So gerrymandering is certainly, certainly a factor, and it, uh, it has affected electoral outcomes uh, in, in numerous, uh, numerous states. Uh, I don't think it's the fundamental, uh, uh, fundamental problem. Uh, the Senate, uh, which is of course not subject to uh, gerrymandering because votes are uh, state-based, unlike the uh, the House, uh, it's also it's also polarized. Uh, it's, it's for that reason that I characterize gerrymandering as a secondary or tertiary, uh, uh, tertiary issue. The, uh, uh, the uh, fundamental uh, problem with, uh, uh, with both of the coalitions that I uh, mentioned is that the extremists do dominate, partly because they shut down free discourse within their own coalition, and the the great the lots of nuances and reservations and so on don't uh, uh, get heard, and partly because the media and uh, the rival coalition focuses on the. Uh, Extreme elements in the in the group, and this is what makes the uh, the uh, intolerances we observe uh, much more uh, much stronger, much deeper than would be the case if individuals could speak on uh, on their own. Thank you. Okay, so I. I'm not actually as optimistic as you give me credit for here, um, because I don't think even if trade unions could be rebuilt, I'm not sure they would do what you want to do. So first let me address how hard it would be to rebuild trade union movement in this country and in other countries that I've studied as well. Australia has different but some of the same problems, many countries in Europe. First of all, with each change in the production form, we've seen different kinds of unions develop we are seeing a total lack of imagination about how to develop a, a labor movement and a union movement around the, the current forms of, of production. The, and the manufacturing sector has been decimated and the industrial unions are therefore largely been decimated. So, you know, until that kind of imagination comes into play, and I, I've been arguing for that for years and I don't have that imagination and I'm not seeing it coming from somewhere else. I do think that we have another problem which makes this much more complicated, which is that the laws in virtually every country, but certainly in the US and the Anglo-Saxon world, make it very hard for unions to build solidarity even, and I do think they do that, against for a larger social process. They build solidarity against bosses. That's what they largely build solidarity about. And there are a couple of exceptions to that in terms of unions, and I've studied some of them, but it's very hard, um, particularly as we see labor parties just falling apart and the kind of ideologies that, uh, again, a lack of imagination perhaps. So it's not so easy. So there's a big step between you know, the call for a revived trade union movement and succeeding in getting a Thanks. revived trade union movement. Any additional comments or thoughts, or since uh, uh, you made a, uh, a contribution to our discussion, uh, uh, if there is no particular reflection on that, why don't we?
take advantage of the fact that now we have seven and a half minutes for our break <laughs> before we have the next panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>